Dear friends, welcome to E-Park Shala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Peet Pune. Today we are going to look at a module titled Electoral Democracy and its Disenchantment, which is part of the Political Sociology paper. What do we mean by electoral democracy? How do we understand the concept of representative democracy as opposed to participative democracy? We have seen that due to the colonial encounter and through the colonial legacy, we have received the whole practice of the institution of democracy. Democracy was foisted upon the natives rather than something that developed through modernity and through enlightenment here. However, this democracy became a framework that not only sought to widen the framework of modernity, it sought to answer and it also attempted to remove disabilities such as untouchability. It also took up questions of women's rights and it also created spaces wherein the voices of the subaltern could be heard. However, as this module will discuss, there were severe limitations to this form of electoral democracy. Electoral democracy and its disenchantment. In India, elections occur at several levels, including the villages, blocks, districts, states, and the national. There are 2,27,000 villages, village councils, 5,900 block councils, and 470 district councils. There are 5,000 MLAs, that is members of legislative assemblies, and over 500 members of parliaments as many as just over 3 million and me women, men and women at any given time hold elected offices. Elections have been regularly held in India since 1952 and on average 60% of the electoral vote, electorate vote reaching as high as 85% in some states in some elections. Over the last 50 years, the turnout in Europe and North America has declined. In India, the turnout has either remained stable or actually gone up. In India, the poor, illiterate and underprivileged people vote in larger proportion as compared to the rich and privileged sections. This is in contrast to Western democracies. More than half of the people also identify themselves as being close to one or the other political party. The electoral system is highly fluid as ruling parties routinely lose elections in India, both at the national and state level. Bhanu Pratap Mehta notes introduction of electoral democracy politicized all areas of organized collective existence in India, including history and culture. Democracy meant the disillusionment of inherited modes of authority. It introduced over time a process of critique that questions and subverts all certainties of social life. Electoral democracy in India has been a wonderful mechanism for chastening certain kinds of authority, making the structure of political power more fluid and creating an assertive and intensely politicized civil society. Deeper democratization produced numerous points of dissent, new conflicts of values and identities, a permanent antagonism of meanings and interests the very mundane process of seeking majorities of building new coalitions led to the mobilization of new groups, unsettled existing power relations and produced new openings. Problems with electoral democracy today. Of late, there is a widespread concern that electoral democracy is in a crisis in India and across the world, that it has stopped performing its basic job of reflecting the popular will and holding power accountable. This crisis has five major dimensions. 
Firstly, there is an emerging perception that competitive elections are not performing the duties of authorization and accountability, especially due to the presence of unequal socio-economic relations. Regular elections in the presence of wide unequal social relations have often become conduits for the formation of oligarchies. Elections require tremendous resources in capitalist societies which allow for a cozy relationship between the political class and the economic elite. For example, one of the main criteria to run for President of the United States is how much campaign money one can raise which deters many interesting contenders from running. Competitive elections have also failed to stem the lack of accountability in terms of transparency in exercise of the representative's mandate. Prevorsky notes that one of the main challenges facing actually existing democracy is the incapacity to ensure that governments do what they are supposed to do and not do what they are not mandated to do. The second major crisis of electoral democracy is that political parties have ceased to be effective vehicles of popular democracy. Very often, parties do not seem to offer a meaningful choice to the voters. In recent years, there has been a decline in ideological differences among parties in most parts of the world. Many major political parties which have to function within the existing capitalist economy are increasingly choosing to implement monetary policies of fiscal deficit and GDP growth over social welfare policies which entail a form of redistribution. As a result, sometimes there is no meaningful difference between major political parties such as Labour and Conservatives in England, Republicans and Democrats in America and UP and NDA in terms of broad policy paradigms. There is also a lack of intra-party democracy in particular that has impeded the growth of a healthier party system. All over the world, there is a tendency in political parties towards the concentration of power in one or few leaders at the top. Parties do not keep membership registers, do not hold organizational meetings, do not conduct, conduct internal elections regularly. Ordinary members of the party do not get sufficient information on what happens inside the party. Some families tend to dominate political parties. Tickets are distributed to relatives from these parties. There is also a gradual but inoxorable withdrawal of the parties from the realm of civil society towards the realm of government and the state. As Peter Mayer notes, this process involves a downgrading of the party on the ground in favor of the party in parliament or in government as leaders opted for responsibility at the expense of responsiveness. He documents the homogenization of the UK Labour Party as it has transitioned from being a dispersed federal organization to a centralized operation that has consistently discarded those grassroots solutions, resolutions with which these leadership disagrees on pensions, defense policy, social ownership of railways and much else besides. The third major problem of existing electoral democracies is the declining quality of public deliberation. Our public sphere is in crisis since matters requiring collective action affect all and citizens hold different views on how these should be addressed. Collective affairs should be publicly discussed and based on some sort of a consensus. Different points of view should have opportunities to express themselves and engage in a public dialogue. However, the public sphere is in crisis given the lack of political information circulating in the political system and the growing distance between state and society. The quality of the deliberation, especially about complex policy issues, is lacking. Some of the information may even be legally available, but most times they are not made part of the deliberative process. There is also continuous attempts by democratic states to weaken the right of information laws by radically limiting its scope and applicability. The radical possibility of opinion are also continuously thwarted by growing corporatization of media which rather than reflecting the plurality of opinions is increasingly promoting a narrow set of views. 
a fourth major crisis afflicting electoral democracy is that legislatures which are the domain of popular decision making are in crisis. Firstly, the other arms of the state are ex eclipsing the traditional role of the legislature. There is a tremendous growth of executive power marginalizing legislatures traditionally considered as the seat of popular sovereignty. The most emblematic example of this crisis is the indiscriminate abuse of the state of exception device in much of the liberal democracies today. The state of exception denotes a situation where powers are granted to the executive to make and pass laws in cases of emergency situation like war or economic crisis. Giorgio Agambem notes that the state of exception is today the rule rather than an exception and that it has become the paradigm of government, including in so-called democratic states. Until the 1990s, around 70 governments have taken regular recourse to this mechanism. In the decade-old rule of UPA government in India, around 61 ordinances were passed, including the all-important food security bill. Legislatures are further threatened by the expansion of the power and the reach of the courts, domestic as well as international. As Wendy Brown notes, courts themselves have shifted from deciding what is prohibited to saying what must be done, in short from a limiting function to a legislative one that effectively usurps the classic task of democratic politics. We can also see a proliferation of manifold unelected technical professionals, entities like central banks and planning commission in our democracies that take a great deal of relevant policy decisions and which are insulated from majoritarian redistributive pressures. Nowhere is this move to supplant legislatures by technology more clearly visible than in the functioning of the European Union. The European Central Bank or ECB is thus the most depoliticized decision makers of all the Eurozone. There is a tendency of EU towards a political system of depoliticized expert governance, especially constructed to exclude parties, popular democracy and with them redistributive politics. We can also see the marginalization of legislatures in India with the rise of good governance paradigm which entails the substitution of assembly politics which is what democracy is all about with management by prime minister's office. As G. Sampath notes, this paradigm shift needs to insulate policy making from the chaotic pressure of democracy and its twin pillar, pillars are democracy without politics and citizenship without rights. It is used to push through many anti-democratic parties like land acquisition, proactively cutting public expenditure on health and education, as well as the dilution of the rights of industrial workers. Secondly, national legislatures are also in a crisis due to the constraints imposed on them by multilateral agreements and globalization in which, which seems to diminish the authority of the legislatures considerably. As Wolfgang Streak points out, today states and the governments are facing two sovereigns at the same time. Their people organized nationally and the markets organized on a global scale. At the national level, we can see that the agents of global capital, world trade organizations, the general agreement on tar tariffs and trade, and various international agreements have successfully removed certain policy solutions from the reach of the elected national legislatures. India's domestic policy recently also came into conflict with the World Trade Organization rules on agriculture. The conflict heated up when India demanded an explicit assurance at the WTO that it could maintain its right to food program. Finally, electoral democracy is facing crisis for failure to be an effective mechanism for mitigating the effects of social inequality and for provision of public goods. There is a tremendous growth of social inequality in, in actually existing democracies. As McNally observes, while more than a billion people do not have access to clean water or adequate food and shelter, there are now three, 793 billionaires in the world whose combined wealth 
is almost incomprehensible to 2.6 trillion US dollars more than the gross domestic product of all but six countries in the world. In fact, the assets of the world's 200 richest people are greater than the combined income of 41 percent of mankind. Leo Panitch adds how there are some 40,000 multinational corporations, 50 of them now receiving more revenue than two-thirds of the world's states. The social democratic state union rights are being slowly dismantled in many democracies. Wolfgang Streak notes that democratic capitalism as a product of post-1945 compromise between capital and labor, an unstable, uh, unstable attempt at combining public expectations with private interests is falling apart. Now more and more capital controls in a broad sense are being removed while one promise after uh, other had been made to buy labor in after 1945 is being slowly withdrawn. Such promises included a steady increase in st living standards, progressive decommodification of labor through an expanding welfare state, politically guaranteed full employment, industrial democracy with an encompassing regime of collective bargaining and trade union rights, a broad public sector providing citizens with social service as well as with stable employment, equal access to education and social advancement, a moderate level of social and economic inequality and the like. All these are now disappearing or being reformed beyond recognition. Overcoming the, the, overcoming the disenchantment with electoral democracy. Many suggestions have been put forward to overcome the crisis of electoral democracy. In this section, we will look into such suggestions, especially drawing from the recent experience of de democratization of electoral democracy in Latin America. Firstly, there is a call for new com complementarities between representative and participatory democracy to improve the authorization and accountability processes of competitive elections. This includes a process of decentering of representation and encouraging a new direct avenue for participation in legislation and administration in the form of frequent referendums and democratic assemblies. Many such ex experiments are currently underway in Latin America. The most successful one is the practice of participatory budgeting in Porte Alegre in Brazil, a local policy that includes common citizens in a process of negotiation and deliberation about how to allocate the resources for the municipal budget. Through the district level assemblies in each of the district cities, 16 districts, the participatory budgeting allows the citizens directly to allocate a significant proportion of the city's budget, especially the new capital investments. Priorities are elected on the basis of the principle one man one vote, according to which every citizen disposes of the same number of votes. There is a move to include accountability mechanisms other than that of elections. Many Latin American democracies have also introduced mechanisms of delegation and recall to restrengthen accountability of representatives. In Venezuela, 20 percent of the population express that they desire a recall mechanism can be initiated against the president. The opposition used the recall mechanism in 2004 to force a referendum on the Chavez government, which he won with, 88, with 58 percent votes. Similarly, in 2008 in Bolivia, Evo Morales government had to face a recall, which it won eventually by 67 percent. In India, the constitution was amended to prevent elected members of legislative assembly and members of parliament from changing parties to tackle the problem of defection. Secondly, across the world, many steps and suggestions are being implemented, put forward to democratize the functioning of political parties. The Indian Supreme Court passed an order to reduce the influence of money and criminals. Now it is mandatory for every candidate who contests elections to file an affidavit giving details of his property and criminal cases pending against them. The election commission passed an order making it necessary for political parties to hold 
their organizational elections and file their income tax returns. Besides these, many suggestions are being proposed by electoral reforms commissions to reform political parties. This includes a law to regulate the internal affairs of political parties, to make compulsory for political parties to maintain a register of its members to follow its own constitution, to have an independent authority, to act as judge in case of party disputes, to open elections to the highest post for the political parties, to give a minimum number of tickets, about one third to can women candidates. There is also a proposal for state funding of elections. Thirdly, there are several attempts at improving the process of public deliberation within modern democracies. Many scholars are increasingly arguing that the overwhelming force focus on elections has displaced the all important process of public deliberation in a polity. They argue for a revival of public sphere, stressing that the job of politics is arriving at common consensus through recent dialogue among citizens. Deliberative mechanisms are being used in many places to bring a closer synergy between the state and civil society. In Bolivia, the section on participation and social control in the constitution established that the sovereign people through organized civil society participate in the design of public policies and exercise social control over the state administration, public enterprises and institutions. The national public policy, a national level experiment promoted by federal executive in Brazil along with civil society organizations gather together ordinary citizens, civil society organizations, private entrepreneurs and elected representatives from three levels of government to deliberate together and agree on a common policy agenda for the country. In Brazil alone, 7 million people are reported to have participated in 82 public policy conferences that took place between 2003 and 2011. Fourthly, there is a move to revive the centrality of legislatures by democratizing the separation of powers within the state and also by moving towards a democratization of international relations. In Bolivia, all three classical branches of governments are subject to increasing vertical control from below. In the case of the judiciary, the top echelons of judiciary are to be elected by popular vote. The constitution has also increased the political influence on supposedly technical issues and bodies. For instance, the central bank has lost its previous level of independence. There is also a move to resist global financial institutions by carrying out debt account. In November 2008, Ecuador became the first country to undertake an experimentation of the legitimacy and structure of its foreign debt. An independent debt audit commissioned by the government of Ecuador documented hundreds of allegations of irregularity, illegality, illegitimacy in contracts of debt to predatory international lenders. As a result, it was declared 70% of his national debt was illegitimate. Fifthly, electoral democracies are initiating many mechanisms to overcome the problem of pervasive social inequality. First, there is an attempt to deepen the rights discourse in our democracy by moving it away from its current narrow focus on property rights and negative freedom. This move from formal to a substantial notion of rights and citizenship can be seen in the recent Latin American democratization process. The fundamental rights recognized by the new Bolivian constitution clearly go beyond the usual series of political and civil rights by strengthening socio-economic and collective rights. They include universal entitlements to free education and health, access to portable water, sewage, electricity, cooking gas and basic postal and telecommunication services as well as social security and retirement. Within the Bolivian framework, the right to pro private property is conditional on its performance or social function and land rights are limited by a ban on the latifundo or large commercial estates which includes an upper limit of 5000 hectares and the requirement to full a socio-economic function. 
In Brazil, there is an interesting experiment to democratize the control of urban space through the right of to the city. It has enacted the city statute des designed to ensure substantial citizenship rights in a city. The first principle is the regularization of informal settlements, favelas, so that inhabitants can be more fully included in various protections and opportunities that the formal sector offers. Here the claim is a right to housing, but also to the many services that typically serve urban residential areas. The second principle concerns the social use value of urban space, which is opposed to, the, to its economic value. The traditional situation in Brazilian cities is that urban land is conceived almost exclusively as a commodity, the economic consent of which is to be determined by the individual interest of owners. Under the city statute, property rights are subjected to the counterclaim of appropriation. It injects a strongly collective, social and public understanding of urban space as a counterbalance to the privatized view of neoliberals. The problem of social inequality is also being tackled by decentering capitalism as the mainstay of economy and looking at the economy as made up of diversity of capitalist, alternate capitalist and non-capitalist practices. And also by strengthening workers' democracy and initiating land reforms. The Venezuelan government under Hugo Chavez, for example, adopted an endogenous development model that prioritized social economy. Through the various forms of micro and small credits granted by the state financial entities, new productive organizations of the social economy were developed. Small and medium sized companies, cooperatives and other forms of associative production. The 2002-2003 oil lockout also gave an important opportunity for workers in Venezuela to organize and control production within public industries. Venezuela has also encouraged slum dwellers to create urban land commi committees for the purpose of rationalizing land tenancy where they live. The existing electoral democracies do mark a great improvement over feudal monarchical and present day authoritarian regimes. The civil liberties and voting rights of ordinary people in electoral democracies today are indeed remarkable when compared with the political, juridical and coercive domination and exploitation experienced by slaves in classical antiquity or serfs and peasants in feudalism. There are strong democratic components within existing democracies, many of which were brought into existence as a result of continuous conflicts and class struggles. However, while one can certainly say that democracy has broadened, one cannot say with the same certainty that it has deepened. The deepening of electoral democracy requires both institutional changes as well as changes in our social relations. Democratization cannot stop with reforming the state, rather there is a concomitant need to democratize all spheres of the society. The concentration of political power in actually existing democracies cannot be understood without looking at that concomitant concentration of economic and social power due to caste, capitalism and patriarchy. Thus, to conclude, in this module we have seen how the representative form of democracy in India has been unable to reach its citizens. Democracy has widened, but it has not deepened. And therefore, the ideal way of going forward would be to move towards participative democracy. And in doing so, we must follow examples that have already taken place through experiments in Latin America, such as Brazil. Thank you.